Okay, today we're going to talk about the respiratory system. Uh, and when we look at the respiratory system, we first look at the anatomy. We look at the mechanism of breathing. Then we'll go into the alveoli. We look at the oxygen exchange. And then we get some control stuff going on. And then we look at a little more at the serous membranes which we, we dealt before. And then we get a sinus thing, and then we talk about how we can make voice, how we phonate briefly. All right, let's start with it over here. When we look at the main function, main function of the respiratory system is to get oxygen from the atmosphere and bring it into the body. And then also the other function as a main one we have is get rid of the CO2. So we'll bring oxygen in to the body from the atmosphere and we get rid of CO2 from the lungs and then the trees put it back into oxygen and that's one reason why we want to not kill the trees because they are the earth of lungs. And it's a big reason for that. <laughs> The rest you can sort of look at yourself. Also, the respiratory system helps maintain the body's acid and base balance. And it does that together with the kidneys, which we're going to look at in a couple of, at the end of the semester, last week, I think. I know, we're getting to the end of the semester. Are you tired too? I know, I'm totally discombobulated. I'm like, I'm like, no, we still got to learn. We can try to make it smooth, but we still want to do some stuff. Um, so, uh, so let's look at that a little bit, because we talked about the acid and base balance. The, the danger of the acid and the bases is that, that the more hydrogens we got in the system, the more acidic the system gets. The more in, concent the more in concentration we have, the higher the ion concentrations, the hydrogen ion concentration. And so the body is, 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 is very, and, and, so too many HC, hydrogen ions make it too acidic. And the body works in a very narrow range of what it can accept of how many hydrogen ion concentrations we have, in concentration we have. So when we have a problem with that, when it is out of balance, then we're going to get a big imbalance, many diseases cause imbalance, and that causes often more problems. That imbalance causes more problems often than the disease itself. So it's very, very important for the body to keep that narrow range as well in check as possible. And it does it in multiple ways. I love this slide. First, we have um, hydrogens can be picked up by neutralized by bicarbonate ions that we have that float around in the solution. So in the, in the bloodstream, we have bicarbonate ions that float around. They pick up a hydrogen ion, then they actually become, so that's inside the blood. Then when that, that shift is too great, that a bicarbonate ion is too much is picked up, too, too much is filled with hydrogen ions, we can go to the lungs, because at that point, a bicarbonate ion with a hydrogen ion becomes this thing, and that's called a carbonic acid. You don't have to know the, the structure or the name, really, but the, the molecule carbonic acid is filled with hydrogen ions, has one on it, and it can go to the lungs, and we can get rid of it and breathe it out, and bring it back, breathe, breathe it out, and make it back into a bicarbonate ion. Sometimes. And so if then that system is overflowing and is used up or is not handling it properly anymore. Then we can go into the kidneys and the kidneys can make more bicarbonate ions and put them into the solution. So we have more available to pick up the hydrogen ions and then have more that can go to the lungs and breathe it out and the cycle gets you know, more, more voluminous. <clears throat> and so that's kind of a good way of sort of understanding that hydrogen ion balancing stuff in the bloodstream um, so we don't get too acidic. When diabetes has an issue with that, you know, that's one of the diseases we have to look for, that stuff. Like the, 
keep what few acidosis, no diabetic acidosis when they have the, the, the breathing smells like sugary, sweet breath. That's, that's when we have too much acidity. So we're looking at that as an overview. In order for that, uh, uh, in order to reach the body cells, the atmospheric oxygen has to travel through the air passages, which are, you know, the nose, the lungs, the trachea, and then it gets all the way down into the deep lungs, into an area where we call the alveoli, and there the oxygen diffuses and gets into pulmonary capillaries and then from the well then it's in there and from there the blood vessels then carry get, go back to the heart by the pulmonary <clears throat> veins and then through the aorta get ejected and go through the whole body and the oxygen then goes into the body tissue and diffuses into the cells where it's needed to make ATP when we make ATP that's where we need oxygen and so then from there, the oxygen gets in, made into CO2, and the CO2 has to go the reverse way and be breathed out into the air. So that's that cycle. Oxygen, CO2 moves together. Um, we have air passageways where the, uh, the air just travels through. Those are the nose, the mouth, the, what, the trachea, the bronchi, and all that. We call that the conducting zone. So we bring the air tubes, bring the air to the area where we actually do the exchange of oxygen from the air into the blood, and that's in the alveoli. And we call that the respiratory zone, because that's where the actual respiration happens. And actually, when we look at respiration, from the outside air to the blood, from the atmosphere to the blood, we call it external respiration, and then from the blood into the tissues, when it exchanges, when the, when the oxygen leaves the blood and goes into the tissues, we call that internal respiration. So that's terminology right there. Conducting zone, respiratory zone, alveoli, external internal respiration. That's sort of the terms in this slide here. So let's take a step back. So when we can take the, the air, airways, we can um, differentiate or separate them in the upper and in the lower air passageways. And the upper air passageways, what they do is they warm, they humidify, and they purify the air. Well, they also guide the air. Um, 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 into the lungs. The most passages, passageways are kept moist by mucous membranes. So whenever you see mucous membranes, you're thinking you spit stuff, moisty stuff, the inside of the mouth. Uh, when you want to go deeper, those are goblet cells and ser seromucus glands that secrete the mucus. We don't need to worry about you know, memorizing that, but it's right here, right now. And then one of those interesting thing is in the upper passageways, we also have cilia, and these are these, these strings, these extensions from the cells. We talked about them when we did the epithelial cells. We talked about cellular extensions, and we talked about cilia. We talked about um, 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 that they stick out of the cell. They're, they're like hairs, kind of, that stick out, but they're, they're, they're whipping. And so when they're moving, they move, actually, they're whipping this way. So they're moving this way, and they, they whip the particles forward and that forward is towards the mouth. All right, so we can get rid of stuff that way. It gets trapped in mucus and then we can spit it out. Or swallow it or whatever happens to it. I mean, it's, it's, it, the stuff can get rid of, can get out of the lungs that way. Or out of the, the yeah, and see here's a whipping motion that you can see. Oh, and look, here we have the separation between upper and lower air passageways. The uh, upper, or the nasal cavity, and then the pharynx. And the pharynx is behind the mouth. Once the mouth and the the, the fluid, the, the liquid fluid, fluid and, and solid stuff joins the air in the mouth, then we call it uh, not nasal cavity. Then we call it the pharynx. 
And once we get bypass the Adam's apple area, where we have the larynx, which is a voice box. Larynx is a voice box. That's where you make voice. Well, that's not really doing too much, is it? We do have a black one. And it's still doing okay. Voice box. I said it's doing okay. I guess that was history. There we go. So that's the larynx is the voice box. And after the larynx, then we call the tube the trachea at that point. And the trachea guides the, guides the air from here down to about here, where we then split. And once we split, we get into bronchi. Bronchitis, have you heard of that word? Yeah. Listen, itis is an inflammation, always. Bronchitis is an inflammation of the bronchi. Oh, uh, is it the larynx or the trachea that like That constricts to what? I don't know, I heard that uh, like the trachea sometimes it blows up. Yeah. Well, all the bronchi and the trachea have muscular parts to it, so they all can be part of the asthma. And whose asthma? Mechanism of asthma? Lungy stuff. Lung stuff. Look, and then we go into more detail on the on the upper airways, the nasal cavity. We have some nice language here. We have the nasal vestibule, that's that hole that we get in. In the nasal cavity, we have two of them, one on each side. And then we got these turbinates, these flaps that sort of come out. And can you give me a skull back there somewhere? Is that open? Is the skull cabinet open? That would be great. Um, and we have them in the skull. We talked about them. We did this, the conscious, the three conscious. And they are lined with tissue. Thank you. So when you look into, into the skull, you see in the nose, into the nose of the skull, from the outside here, you see these little flaps coming down. That's what then is lined with tissue and becomes these turbulence. And when you breathe in the air, the air comes in here, and those flaps are shaped this round way, and the air has to start circulating as it comes in. And then that's like when you look at the river, in the middle of the river, the water goes faster than on the outside. It sort of curls up a little bit, and it goes slower. Same thing here. The air gets slowed down. The flow of air gets slowed down as it goes by these turbulence. And these turbulence are heavily uh, innervated by venous plexi, a mucous membrane, so that mechanism is right here to warm and humidify the air. As it slows down, as it goes by these membranes, it gets warmer and it gets more humid. And you feel the effects of these membranes when you breathe the air down into the lungs, when you go to a cold climate in the winter and you breathe through the mouth versus through the nose, it's, you can get a burning down in here. And you feel that that way. I don't know if you've experienced that before. So that's when. You go, that's why you want to breathe through the nose, it's because of these, these pockets. So that's pretty cool stuff. I like that a lot. I have a technique that they told me. Do you take a balloon on a blood pressure pumpy thing? Like a balloon, like not a real balloon, but you, a finger cup, like a finger cup, and you wrap it around, and then you guide it into the nose and you pump it up. And it, it cracks the skull from the inside out a little bit. And so if somebody has, has, has a concussion with a force comes from the outside and, and yanks on it and the suit just get jammed and you cannot, the brain cannot breathe anymore because the cerebral spinal fluid is not ro rotating around. That's one reason. So you, do that. you can do that and go all the way up here and the sphenoid is a bone that all the other bones attached to it. The sphenoid gets then pushed up a little bit and that unlocks that pressure. I know, it's crazy. But it's a balloon, so it's soft, right? It seems really, yeah, it's a little bit painful, but it's not bad. It's like when you're breathing chlorine in the poop. It's a little bit like that, but it doesn't stay. The singing goes away. Yeah, I have a video where my teacher does it on me. And, and he, yeah, I, my teacher does that technique on me. I have a video of that. But, so you guide a balloon up and you pump it up. And it expands and it, it 
pushes. You go right under here. You go up a little, like in the under. The, you do three of them under under every concha. You go in and you pop it off a little bit. And it's very interesting. I mean, my teacher had one client of his um, uh, hit her head on a on a half pipe snowboarder, and he did it for like I think two months or six weeks, and she won the gold medal after. And she couldn't stand on one leg first when she came in. She would fall over. That's how dizzy she got. And so that's really impressive. And so it's really interesting that that works with those conscious. But for our purposes, when you have a concussion or a whiplash, you call me. Then we talk about that. No, well, you might not want to do it. But you know, at least I want to know how bad. We, we might need to do it. Who knows? Or, or we can talk about it at least. But for your purposes, the conscious are here to warm and to humidify um, um, the air, so when we get into the lungs where we're going to have a more delicate environment, we're, we're sort of ready for that, and it's not like bringing the cold down uh, uh, into it. That, that makes us not as resilient to the cold. So that's the turbulence. Another thing we have here is the sinuses. We're going to talk about the sinuses briefly. We have multiple sinuses, so they're paranasal sinuses, so that's next to the nose sinuses. Sinuses are in, in the vascular system, we talked about the blood. There is a sinus uh, that the, the venous blood brings, brings the blood back from nurturing the heart. There's a sinus, so that's a, an area in the blood system that's a little ba baggy, a little bit more enlarged. In the skull, those are chambers. So sinuses are chambers of the bone that are um, hollow spaces. And what their purpose is, is their help um, warm the inspired air, but they also create resonance for a voice. And you can't even see them here. Well, never mind. You can't see them here <laughs> on this one. Um, and they also make the skull a little bit lighter, unless they fill up with fluid and then it hurt, if you have sinusitis. Um, so then what they do is they, from there, they connect. There are these chambers that connect to the nasal cavity. And um, sometimes, they fill up with mucus because they get infected and the mucus makes stuff and then the holes get clogged or blocked the opening and we get sinusitis and it hurts. So what I do when that happens, I have an antibody and I go bloop, 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 and then honk. <laughs> I part of like honk. But uh, you know, that helps flush that stuff out. Right now it's pretty bad because it's the, of the of the some allergy stuff. Um, the maxillary sinuses, which are the ones right here in the maxilla, so they're made by the bones that they're in. If you haven't noticed that, this frontal and frontal bone, maxillary, ethmoid, sphenoid. The the maxillary ones are the ones that get most build up. They're most vulnerable to build up because the hole and, and where they empty into the nasal cavity goes upward and not just downward. So it goes against gravity. So that's that for the sinuses. All right. And then we go deeper down from away from the nasal cavity. We'll go into the pharynx and into the larynx. And so behind, below, well, actually, right, we can go actually a little bit right up here. So if that flap would stick up a little bit, it would be right here. So that part back here is the top layer of the pharynx. We call that the nasal pharynx because it's in the nasal cavity. And then we got a portion behind the mouth, we call that the oral pharynx because it's behind the mouth. And then we got a part behold, lower, and that's behind, well here it says the hypopharynx. Often we also call that the laryngopharynx because that's like behind the Adam's apple, there where the larynx is. And then below that we have the larynx, and that's known as the voice box because it makes voice, vocalization. Um, it has the ability to close the lower passageways up, making it possible to raise the thoracic or abdominal pressure, which helps us strain or cough. So when you cough and you get that, want to get some stuff out of there, you close that passageway down here, the larynx, you close that down, and you can, you can increase the pressure, and then when it opens, it's like it pushes it out. But it, you know, it's like you hold, the, you close the, the hose of a, of a water hose and you hold it and it builds up and then it comes out, you know, fast and furious. Uh, so that's 
one of the things we can use that larynx for, but the other thing, of course, is to make voice uh, to talk. And so that makes the structure a little bit more complex. And right here, we have the Adam's apple, and that's right here. That's the thyroid cartilage tip in the Adam's apple. Um, and so that structure down here, on the side here, that's the thyroid cartilage right in this area here. So you've got one on both sides, left and right, and you can sort of touch it. And then right underneath, you've got a little bit of a dent, and then you've got another bump, another bump, and that next bump that you bump in there is another cartilage, and that's called the cricoid cartilage. So you've got thyroid, you've got cricoid. And the cricoid cartilage is interesting. From the front, it's this little skinny thing, and from the back, when you look from the back, that's from the back. So the thyroid are here from the back. The other one is right big in the back. The cricoid is big in the back. And from the cricoid moving upward, we have another set of cartilage called the arytenoid cartilages, right here, arytenoid cartilages. And those stick up and they rotate this way. They can turn around, they have muscles that move them around this way, from side to side, okay? And when, and, and, and they're gonna be helping, oops, in pitch, making pitch. So let me, let me get my, let me gather myself here, it's a little bit. So here, when you, this is another picture, so now you have, you have, the arytenoid sticking up here, now we're gonna look down from above down, and when we look down this way, the arytenoids are right here, so these are the sticking out things, the sticking up things coming up at you. And then this is front, this is back. And on them attached, we have the vocal cords. They go forward, like guitar strings, we have guitar strings. Vocal cords, guitar strings. And so depending on how they rotate, they either close the vocal cords, make the hole here. The hole is called the glottis, actually. Well, never mind. We don't need to have that word right now. When the hole closes, we get a higher pitch. We get those strings get tauter, and then, like the high string on the guitar. And then the, they move outward, or I actually don't know how to move in or out, but they move the other way, and it opens it up more. And then this hole gets bigger, and then we get the deeper voice because the strings are more loose. And the air from the lungs, this is the lung down here, the air from the lungs coming upward as you breathe out, as you talk, that vibrates these cords, and then that we make voice. There you go, that's it. Not, no, not quite. But I think we have mostly, I see the opening, the glottis, that's just the word there, that's good. Um, voice production is phonation, that's another word. And that's about it for that. What do you, have not talked about on this slide is the epiglottis. The epiglottis. So the epiglottis is on top of the hole. So the hole going up and down is made by these, you know, thyroid and cricoid cartilage, and then the epiglottis is on top, and that's a flat. And that's a flat going up like that, backwards and up, up and you know, down and back and up and forward. And when it's down, it's covering the hole. When it's downward, it's covering the hole. That's when we swallow. So when it's down, it pushes down, it's covering this hole. So when we eat and we swallow, this whole thing moves up. This goes down, and the food and the water liquid does not go down into the lungs. It's like a, a roof. So we make a roof. When we swallow, the roof goes down. When we don't swallow, the roof is up. So that's very helpful. So, and that's why when we talk and eat at the same time, sometimes things don't work out quite well. And the food gets confused with going down the pipe where it goes to the stomach, but it ends up going down the pipe. Then it goes into the lungs and we choke. And then we see people do this. And then we'll talk about that in a minute because we have a slide on that, I think. Maybe it's in the digestive system, I'm not sure. Um, what, what I wanted to talk about down here 
briefly the doctor difference between vowels and consonants. Vowels are formed within the larynx down here. O, R, E, O, U, R, all those things. They're down here. And then consonants are made in the tongue, the teeth, and the lips. So up in the mouth. So that's the difference between vowels and consonants. And these here are sort of the muscles that move these uh, arytenoid cords around. And if you want to go further, we'll we give you an anatomy book link. And then we'll fi you figure that out. But it's really cool stuff. We just talked about that. Oh. Good. So that leaves us. Uh, we're going to talk about the Heimlich maneuver in that when we eat when we talk about digestion, because it's the food that goes to the wrong pipe. Um, and after the epiglot is here, we can go further down, and now we get to the lower uh, airways, and that's the trachea. So below the arytenoid, the Adam's apple, and one is the crick cord, and then after that, you actually have trachea. But if you go, it's still kind of ripply. There's still ripplies if you go a little deep. I know, don't joke yourself, but you still feel cartilage stuff. And so the trachea is uh, interesting. It's a, it's a windpipe that has cartilage in the front, going around halfway, and the back is no cartilage. Back is open. Because what we have in the back is another tube. And that's the food tube. That's the esophagus, and we're going to talk about that. That's the gullet. And then food comes, and that is, see how flat that is? That's a cross section, that's flat. And so the thing is, food and water, liquid, have enough force that they can go down and they push that open. Air was not going to do that. So, air, we keep the air pipe open for the wind going up and down. But the food can expand into the air pipe when we, when we swallow because there are no cartilage in the back. So, it's soft. And so, that's what happens with that. So, that's why we have these. We have the rings to keep the air pipe open and patent. That's the word for open is patent. And we have it open in the back or no, no cartilage in the back. So the food pipe can uh, push into it when the food goes down. So that's kind of cool for that part. And then when we get down to here, right here, we got one cartilage that's sort of weird. That's like a crossing. No, it's not a crossing. What is it called? When one goes into two. It's like in the railroad. Um, uh, uh, but we have, we have then, a, from there, it, it separates into a, into a, a bronchi here and into a bronchi here, a right bronchi and a left bronchi. We'll call them primary bronchi. The first split off is a primary bronchi. Um, this cartilage right here is known as the carina. And if you swallow something and it hits this here, you have a violent cough. So if you get like something goes in the wrong pipe, you have a violent cough, it's a reflex, you know your carina was talking to you. And it's not the girlfriend. Um, that was bad. The, um, the right bronchi, the right primary bronchi, is more prone for foreign artists to fall into because it is wider and more vertical. The aortic arch runs over the left bronchus, so it's a little bit, little bit swayed this way. And then from there, we have a bronchial tree. So the primary or the main bronchi goes into a secondary or a lobar bronchi, which goes into a tertiary or a segmental bronchi, and blah, blah, blah. So when you look up here, you see how the tree goes further and further into smaller and smaller branches. The last bronchiole, the very small ones at the end we call bronchiole, the last bronchioles are called terminal bronchioles, the last ones, the end. And then from, that's the ones that still have a little cartilage in it. They're like these last little bits of cartilage here. And then from there, we get into a, bronch, a bronchi that has alveoli, these little air sacs sticking from them. And at that point, we call that the respiratory, uh, well, actually the alveoli, the last portion here is the respiratory bronchiole and then we get into 
the part that the alveoli come from, and that's the alveolar duct. What do you need to know from that? Bronchi have many, just the trees. And we'll just go which layer of tree. And, and for the most part, the air gets brought in to the tree. There's no gas exchange, no oxygen exchange, until we reach the respiratory bronchi bronchial, and that's where we have gas exchange. And from there, then, we get into the air sacs, I hope. Nope. Almost. Nope. Tell me to go back. Nope. Let's just finish that part. From there, we get then into the air. So this is the terminal bronchial. And then we got the respiratory bronchial coming off of here. And there the air sacs start coming out. And that's where... On, the, on one membrane side, this is like paper thin. This is like squamous epithelial tissue. And then on the other side, we got blood vessels, capillaries. And so we got these branches of the pulmonary arteries from follow the bronchial tree, where a network of capillaries facilitate gas exchange by picking up oxygen and releasing CO2. So that's happening right here, that exchange. Okay, and then the pulmonary veins, as they come from there, the pulmonary veins then carry the oxygenated blood. This is why this is red. It's oxygenated blood, but they're called veins because they carry to the heart from there. Now we go back. So that gives us more or less that pathway. Um, or, you know, deeper superficial. What I want to talk to here about is the serous membranes. And we already talked about that in the heart, how the heart is enclosed and now there's a membrane that goes from the, that is not, that is continuous and part is on the outside and the, that attaches to, the, to, the, to the, the body wall and the other part of the membrane is on the inside attaching right to the heart. And remember that? We have that visceral layer, the parietal layer. And so we have that same thing in the lungs where that thing is continuous. You've got a visceral layer and a parietal layer. Um, and inside, there is a fluid. So we got a serous fluid inside of here. And so in the lungs, the cool thing about this now is the pressure in that inside, in between those membranes, the intrapleural pressure, they call that, is lower than the one in the lung. And so that suctions the lungs to the walls of the lung. So the serous membrane system in the lung, what's important there, it creates a suction of the lungs to the chest wall to ensure that when the chest wall expands when we breathe, because breathing is a chest wall expansion only, the lungs will follow it and they fill up with them. Make sense? And then this talks about that suction so the intra, so oh, in the lungs, in the heart we call it the pericardium. In the lungs we call it the pleura, pleura. So it's not pericardium, it's pleura. So if you have a visceral pleura and a parietal pleura. And maybe some of you heard pleurisy before. Pleurisy, that's an infection of that membrane. And when you have that, breathing feels like sandpaper rubbing. It's really painful. Oh, I don't, I never, thank God, I don't want to have it. But it's like that. So, now we can go to that next slide, because here when it says the intrapleural pressure is below the atmospheric pressure, that means the pressure inside that membrane here, inside of it, is lower then the pressure inside the lung is the same pressure on the outside. And that creates a suction. It's like when you know you have meat and you suction it out, or wherever you, that's the same concept. Yeah? So when people have to get like a fluid with the fluid, is the fluid in the lungs, around the lungs, where is the fluid in the What's the thing? You know, I'm, I'm on the thoracic synthesis, I'm not sure where it's coming from, but when you have an injury, and that might give us a clue, when you have an injury, you potentially have air going in between this space, like, you know, 
a, a knife. Hmm. A knife stabbing or something. You've got air going in. This suction goes away. You've got a pneumothorax. So you're going to have the lung collapse. Then this space is, um, is not functioning anymore. That's the intrapleural space at that point. What we do is we go in and, and we suction out. We suction the lung back into, and we close the hole up. So we suction out the air here. Or if we have a pneumothorax, because we have some block accumulation here, we can suction out the bottom. That's where I don't know which ones they do, which ones they mean by that. Yeah. Some words pass by me. So that's that situation. So that's kind of cool. That that picture kind of helps. The lungs get pushed this way. You know that that force that suction in here. Good. And then that brings us to the bigger anatomy of the lungs. We have a right lung. We have a left lung. Uh, we have um, front of the lung is the mediastinum, the, uh, uh, the breastbone. We have uh, uh, the diaphragm below. We don't need to talk about all of that. But the right lung has three lobes, an upper, a middle, and a lower. And the left lung has two lobes, an upper and a lower lobe. And that's because we got a heart that needs some space, a little more on the left. So there's a little bit of an indentation here, impression. And so then we have different separations of the lobe, and we call them fissures, like in the longitudinal fissure in the brain. And we have here a horizontal fissure, and then we have on both sides an oblique fissure. So the right lobe has two fissures because it got three lobes. The left lobe has two fissures because it got two lobes. And then we have further divisions into pulmonary segments. Anything that says pul pulmonary, you know that's long, right? Just that through your brain go. Um, and those are important landmarks. They're subdivisions of the lobes when we look at you know, x-rays or when we want to do surgery. So there are these pictures for here to separate them out into the different uh, segments. I mean, I'm not memorizing these myself. Um, uh, and then where the vessels on the inside medially, all the vessels go in and out of the lung. So right here, this is a picture this way. Let me show you on the on the um, lung here. So we have the cross section of the lung here. This is actually the model we're going to use in class uh, or in lab. Here on the side medially, you've got all these the bronchi go in and the vessels come in and out. That section here, that part here, is known as the hilum. Hilum, right here. We got the same thing in multiple organs, but we call that the hilum. And then we already talked about the real to this spot. And we basically already talked about um, the suction situation. Um, right down here. Ventilation of the lungs means bringing oxygen-rich fresh air into the alveoli and getting rid of oxygen-poor or carbon dioxide-rich air uh, out of the alveoli. So that's the ventilation. Um, and the ventilation process is possible because we got that suction where the intrapleural pressure is below uh, the atmospheric pressure and that makes the lungs be guided by the chest wall. And now all we need to do to get air in and out of this lung, we gotta pump this stuff up and down and make the air go in and out. And the chest wall can accomplish that because we got muscles on the chest wall. And we got muscles on the chest wall, they can raise up the chest wall. Those are the external intercostals. And the other thing that we got, we got a diaphragm here, that's sort of a parachute muscle that goes up into the lungs from here, and when we breathe down and we get the belly, the belly goes out a little bit, we can fill the lung up. This goes down, and all this space can be used for air going into the lungs and fill them up. And so here's a good picture where you can see this motion here is all right, but this motion here, that's a big kahuna. So we want to ventilate our body well 
we breathe with our stomach and we don't give a rat's ass if it's sticking out a little bit because we're not in the military because it's better for us it's healthy because it relaxes us more oxygen more energy more ways to to deal with the world of the stress and all that relaxation it's fit it's, it's chemical it's not meditational I have one patient she's like oh that's kind of crap I'm like really is it more oxygen what's the crap in that it's not voodoo uh, but you know if you have a problem with relaxation one of the tools you can do or with stress management and learning how to breathe through difficult situations you can lay on, on your bed and put a book on top of your belly and, and sort of do a five minutes or a few minutes and see going up and down and that sort of helps you reinforce um, that sort of breathing and then it's easier to do it when you're in a <gasps> oh my god and you forget to breathe it's like I can do it like a test or something you know I don't know no more excuse for test anxiety uh oh so um, th so the, the quiet breathing mostly happens with the diaphragm and the external intercostals that the external intercostals are right here they go from the from the upper ribs actually this is the funny way they call it like the inferior border of the rib above to the superior border of the rib below it's like it took me three times reading that before I understood it and what they do is they pull the ribs up and make it bigger so that brings the chest ball out like that and then when we exhale exhale is kind of quiet it just happens that the chest collapses and the air gets pushed out but we can also have forced inspiration and expiration. So in forced um, inspiration, we got a whole bunch of muscles that are used up here to pull the chest higher. You know, anything you can think of making the big, making it bigger, that's forced expiration. Uh, inspiration, inspiration, wherever that went. Uh, and then in forced expiration, that's when we use muscles. And uh, not just have a passive, but use muscles to compress the chest further. So we use the internal intercostals that way that pulls it sort of in and out. They're inside. They go from the, the from 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 they go from here to here and pull it up. And then we have also the abdominal muscles that can bring it down further and collapse it further. So we have both a regular breathing, a quiet breathing, and we also have a forced forced breathing because you know you've got to run away from the line in the corner there you've got to better bring some oxygen into this lung and here look at that it can have regular breathing and this here is measuring how much how many milliliters and you just you take you take three out when you have liters right so, so that's three liters it's three thousand milliliters that's three liters one liter is about a quart so about three quarts of air is three liters just so you know the measuring more or less you know quart that's a gallon quart is less than that's quarter gallon um, and so when we do the regular breathing we go right around here up and down a little bit we're sitting down in the classroom we're listening and blah 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 and that's about half a liter that's about a, a pint of air going in and out when we don't do nothing so that's about a pint and we call that the tidal volume. The tide, just up and down with the tide. No storm, nothing. It's very, very nice and peaceful. And then we can have a forced breathing. And when we forcefully inhale, we get all the way up to here. We go. Six liters go in there. Six liters. Not 0.5. No, I mean, not six altogether, but a lot more go in there. And then we go down, and then we're gonna have to forcefully expire, and we can go all the way down to here and let all the air out. And so that gives us a whole range of what we can have in volume going in and out of the lung from all the way down here to all the way up here. That's from like around 1,200 here or so, let's say 1,000, it doesn't matter, to about almost 6,000. So we got a large range of how we can have go air go in and out so we get about a two and a half liter or two and a half quarts more from top of the tidal volume to the, all the way to the top we call that the inspiratory reserve volume and we got about a 1.5 quarts 
then we can get rid of air extra once we're down here. We call it the expiratory reserve volume. And together, we then have a vital capacity of a lot of air. Is that what, about 4,800, I think? So when we just sit there, it's about a pint. When we really go from fully expired to fully inspired, we got about we got about four four liters. No, look at that. We got four liters right here. We got four and a half liters. So we got about nine times of this puppy that we can do when we have to run. And we got to really go for it. So you got to practice. How we practice? Oh, cardiovascular exercise. That's how we practice. So that's the treadmill, that's the walk outside, that's the non couch marching the movie do people do it. We gotta do it ourselves. And so, you know, if we're church couch potating around, we're not reaching all of this probably. But if we're training ourselves, then we can reach that stuff. Well, I don't know, I'm making that one up. I just want you to move. I just want people to move. So I don't feel all alone getting up in the morning, I gotta, I gotta really go move now. Because that really lazy act. All right, but anyway, that's the vital capacity. It's the whole in and out that we can have. And then, oh, and it can be measured by a spirometer. So we're, we have an object that measures how much air goes in and out, basically. Even after forced expiration, some gases remain in the lungs to help keep the airway open or patent. We call that the residual volume. And that's down here. That's the residual volume. Air remaining in the air passages does not contribute to gas exchange because it never reaches the alveoli. And so we have some air that never even goes down into the lungs. That always stays up here. It doesn't go into the alveoli. Okay, that's the anatomical dead space. Good, and then the Indian password is good. And then we have um, air going in and out in the alveoli. So let's look a little bit more on the alveoli. Most cells we have, so this is like cellular now, right? This is tiny, tiny. I mean, you can see one of those on the long model. It's deep in here. This is a cell. This is a cell. So we've got different cells. We've got alveolar cells. Those are the type 1 pneumocytes, they call them also. Those are the ones that do the gas exchange. But then you also have type 2 pneumocytes. And those secrete liquid, they secrete a fluid, surfactant, it's called. And so it's a phospholipid-containing fluid that coats the interior of the alveoli, reducing surface tension. Reducing surface tension. We talked about that hydrogen bomb thing, right? Hydrogen molecules are kind of cool. They, they, you know, they sort of make lattices together. And so they, they create its own tension. They create its own, how should I say? Um, like as, as small as lids, they can walk on water. It doesn't go through. So that's a tension right there that it creates. It's just, it's we're too heavy. It just goes way through for us. But that tension, if it's in a small space, like a small little ball, that will pull together and collapse that ball. And so the alveoli that do not have phospholipids that sort of phospholipids, that's, what's, what's phospho? Lip, what's lipid? Fat. Fat goes, it's like an emulsifier the other way around. Fat goes in between the water molecules and disperses it and makes that tension not as strong. and makes it a little weaker so these alveoli can actually open. And if the baby, the, the embryo, does not make surfactant, if it's not old enough to make surfactant, it cannot be viable on its own in the, in the air because the alveoli will never expand. They always stay collapsed. And that, and that was the determining, the, the determining factor. When was a baby viable until we made artificial surfactant that we can get the previous and now we're fine with that. But so that is what is done by these type two pneumocytes. So they're very, very important, but they're not the ones that actively bring the oxygen into the system. Um, and then we got Oh look, they're right here. Then we got dust cells. Well, there is no dust cell in here. There is no dust cell in here. The dust cells right there. And dust cells, alveolar macrophages. They come from monocytes. Remember, but the white blood cell monocyte turns into a macrophage in a tissue, 
and then it stays there and lives there. And we call these different, in the, in the skin it was the longer arm cell. Here it's the dust cells. I like dust cells, it's kind of like the vacuum cleaner. They clean up the dust. That goes into the lungs, that's how I remember it. Too much dust, you know. Makes it too stuffy in there. Good. And then from a gas exchange perspective, what we need to know there, as far as I'm concerned, is the, is the fact that, so here's the alveoli and then here's the capillary. And the alveoli comes from, this is blue, that means deoxygenated. So when you look at the pressure, so when you look at the gas exchange across diffusion, across the membrane, diffusion follows a concentration gradient. It's passive. So you're looking at partial pressure of a gas. So you're looking at a, 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 a gas or liquid, you can figure out how many, how many oxygens are in there. So that's a partial pressure of oxygen. You can say, how many oxygens are in here? That gives me the pressure of oxygen. Well, it's 40 millimeters of mercury amount of oxygen. So that gives you a measurement of the amount of concentration. In here, the partial pressure of oxygen is 104, more or less, millimeters of mercury. So this is a much higher number than this. And so the gradient is very steep. So oxygen wants to go straight from here into here. Wants to go down the concentration gradient. It's diffusion. Gas exchange, diffusion. See here, diffusion. Did I do that right? Yeah. And then see, look at that. At the beginning of the capillary, it's 40 millimeter, millimeters of mercury. And at the end of the capillary, it's 104. So it equaled out to what the one is in the lungs. Okay? So that's how we pick up oxygen. The, re the same is true for, for carbon dioxide. It's just not as grave. It's like a five millimeter difference. And so, but it balances out too. Just the other way. So that's diffusion. That's a prime example of diffusion if you ever need to use an example for it. They're kind of cool. Oxygen channels bound to hemoglobin. The amount of oxygen saturation in a hemoglobin depends on the partial pressure of oxygen. The higher the partial pressure of oxygen, the more oxygen is carried in the by the blood. That makes sense, right? The, that's the higher number. That's that partial pressure. Strong dissociation of oxygen by the hemoglobin happens when the when when the oxygen partial pressure in the hemoglobin is dropped to about 50%. So what that tells us here is so as the as the hemoglobin travels through the blood through the blood into the tissues, the oxygen needs to jump into the tissues. They need to get from the tissue, from the blood, in, from the hemoglobin into the tissues to give the tissue then oxygen to make ATP. If the tissue has a lot of oxygen already ready, and we don't need to make that much ATP right now, we don't need as much oxygen than if the tissue is working really hard and uses up all the oxygen. And so if the tissue is, is more acidic, for example, as more carbon dioxide in it, we then have a faster release or a more, more com complete release of the oxygen from the hemoglobin into the tissues to supply with more oxygen. Because the higher the acidity, the higher the carbon dioxide content of the tissue, we know that means the lower the oxygen content. Because all used up oxygen becomes carbon dioxide. Also, for example, if we know that the hemoglobin is carrying oxygen saturated at a low rate, the hemoglobin also pushes the oxygen away further because we know we don't have as much available anymore, so we don't release as much at all at once. And so the tissues also get more saturated by it. So this is really cool stuff. So that tells us, depending on what is needed, this curve shows that, it's a little complicated, but this curve shows it. But it means, depending on what the tissues need, the oxygen regulates itself a little bit of how much goes into the tissue and how much bypasses that tissue goes to the next tissue that needs it. So that's what that kind of shows. So that's um, kind of neat. But that gets into the higher part of the respiratory system. So you, you pick that up next semester or whenever you take that, if you go further in it. And then 
Where's the carbon dioxide? Where's the carbon dioxide? I don't have a carbon dioxide slide anymore. <laughs> That's good enough. Then we have, instead of carbon dioxide here, this word means carbon monoxide. So this is CO, not CO2. And the problem is carbon monoxide, and it has a real, real great affinity to oxygen. What does that mean? That means it loves oxygen. I mean, that it loves carbon monoxide more than oxygen. So if there's carbon monoxide present, the magnet pull is much stronger than oxygen. So in that case, if carbon monoxide is present, that's smoke. All the hemoglobin fills up with that. And the tissue doesn't know what to do with that. But it needs oxygen, and it's not getting the oxygen because all the hemoglobin is filled with carbon monoxide. And so that's when you, know, you get the exhaust, in the, in, you, know, you get the exhaust people that die from that or something because they, they, they just saturate the hemoglobin that no oxygen is in the tissue. You think that everything is fine because they actually look red because the carboxy hemoglobin looks, much, looks red as well. So you don't think they have any problem but they do not get any, the tissues that not get any oxygen that helps them make ATP, so they die off. And so that's the problem with carbon monoxide. Its affinity to hemoglobin is much, much stronger than to oxygen. Hypoxia means lower levels. Um, dark blue stuff. Hypoxia means we do not have enough oxygen. We're oxygen deficient. So we can see that in this coloration, that's the kid going to the swimming pool too long. You see the blue lips, you're like, you're coming out, kid. You don't say, uh, like, the kids are like, ay, 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 ay. So then, no, you're still coming out, I'm the boss. Do not make the mistakes we made with like, the kids ask for their opinion all the time. When they're 20, they think they have a voice. And you have a like, oh, shush. We still gotta know who's the boss. Well, part of what raising a kid means you have to make sure they function in society later on. It's not about mine is always the best. That's like, uh... Anyway, enough of that. So cyanosis, you can see it on the lips, but you can also see it in the fingers. This should be the fingers here, should be blue, and the toesies. Yeah, put a blanket over that kid. <clears throat> anoxio, anoxio is, is the insufficiency of provide the cells with oxygen. One of the places we can see is clubby fingers. <coughs> it's one of the things we can see. Good, and then that brings me to the almost the last slide, the control of breathing. Respiratory movements of the chest and diaphragm are coordinated by rhythmic excitation of nerve cells in the medulla oblongata. We just learned the medulla oblongata. Inspiratory nerve, nerve neurons activate muscles of the inspiration until stretch receptors in the lungs reflexively inhibit them and stimulate expiratory neurons. That makes sense. Breathe in, stretch is like it's ripping, breathe out. We go before the ripping. Okay? And then we got nuclei in the palm, in the palm, look at that, call that palm T nuclei. Further regulate fi and fine tune the force and the depth of breathing. So that's you know, like, you know, what we talked before with that graph up and down. How much you need to go in and how fast. How fast do you want to run away from the lion? Partial pressure of oxygen, and particularly CO2 in the blood, as well as the arterial pH, influence the respiratory rate and the depth of breathing. So if the CO2 goes too high, we breathe more and faster. That kind of stuff, right? If we have too much acidity in the system, we breathe more and faster to get rid of that stuff. Because we talked about it first, one of the functions is to get rid of the CO2 of the acidity in the system, and that's how we can do that. Chemoreceptors in the aorta of the carotid artery, but also near the respiratory centers of the central nervous system, continuously monitor blood concentration of various chemicals. Breathing can also change due to the increase of pain, temperature, emotional excitation, of muscular work, and other factors. The word chemoreceptors just tells you that's, a, that's, that's often in the bloodstream. That's, um, the receptors that pick up chemicals in the bloodstream and then feed it into the brain and say like, is this the right amount? Do we need more or less? And so breathing 
is influenced by chemoreceptor uh, readings because, again, acidity, we can get rid of acidity by breathing more deeply. So that's kind of cool. All right, I think that's good enough for that. So let's see, what time is it?